Goeie dag, ek ken vandag saam met Elna Rudolf, so is sy so bekend op televisie en ook in die land. En Elna, welkom in Stellenbos, is lekker hier in Stellenbos saam met jou. Dankie Theo, dit is so lekker om hier te wees. Elna, in die Bijbel is daar nou hierdie band tussen seksualiteit en spiritualiteit, maar toch lyk dit vir my of die kerk verskrikkelijk sikkel daarmee, want daar is ook ook een van die groot skande van die predikkerk. Wat denk jy is die probleem daar? Ek denk, dit is die vijandse strategie om seker te maak dat ons nie oor die goed praat nie. Want as ons nie daarover praat nie, bly dit in die donker en dinge wat in die donker is, is in sy realm. Dit is nodig om die goed te bepraat. Mens loop nie elke dag, heel dag en praat somme oor seks onder enige omstandighede nie, maar daar is nie geen plek en tyd om daarover te praat nie, en in die kerk moet ons praat en praat en praat en praat, en nie afpraat op mense, en net vir hulle sê, dit is wat jy moet en nie moet doen nie, want het werk nie, mense het ongelooflike uitdagings rondom seksualiteit binnen in die hevelik, hoe moet hulle met hulle kinders praat, wat hulle tieners aanvang, die weet mense se drange en behoeftes en daar is nie eenvoudige antwoorde vir die goed nie. Ek het nou met het betrokke op een baie globale politiese vlak ook by die Wereldorganisatie vir Seksuele Gezondheid en hoe meer ek daarby betrokke is, hoe meer kom ek achter dat dit is rechtig kompleks. Die antwoord is nie moedwendig eenvoudig nie, maar die waarheid bly daar, en ek glo, Godse waarheid, vir seks is eindelijk universeel toepasselik, maar ons gaan het moet bepraat. Ja, nou nou, wat met die paal vir maan nou vir die kind sê, want <laughs> ons vraag gewoonlik vir die 12-13 jaar, waar het jy nou gehoor van seks? En dan, ons lag verskrikkelijk, jy weet, want dit kom nooit van die paal nie maas, en sê mm. nie maar, as ek nou denk aan myself, so as ek word ongemakkelijk, weet nie mm. hoekom nie. Ja. Maar wees so, wat, wat met die paal nie maas nou doen, en jy het nou hierdie tiener wat in die hormoonontploffing belang? Ja, die ding is dat 12 of 13 is heel te mal te laat. In Engels sê hulle uit is too late. So, jy moet met die kind praat oor seksualiteit recht van die begin af, van geboorte af. En dit is net iets wat uh, jy rassel dan ook, as jy dit van die begin af doen, teen, 12 of 13, baie gemakkelijker daarmee wees, en jou kind is gemakkelijker. Want as jy op daar die ouderdom eerst die onderwerp ophaal, dan sien jou kind hoe ongemakkelijk jy is, en dan besef hulle, hulle kan nie met jou daarover praat nie, want hulle hou nie daarvan om jou ongemakkelijk te maak nie. So, een mens praat natuurlijk nie oor technische detail, man, ek het een paar grade, en ek het nie eens al die technische detail in my grade geleer nie, jy weet, so, dit is nie iets wat een mens met, uh, met die kind bespreek nie, maar jy praat oor dinge soos toestemming, en soos, jy weet, daar is niks fout met jou lijf nie, maar ons is nie kaal vir ander mense nie, want ander mense het die recht om nie aan genitalie bloot gesteld te word nie, by voorbeeld, jy weet, so dit is, dit is die punt, dit is die waarheid, nie, daar is iets fout met jou genitalie en daarom moet jy dit toemaak nie, so hoe meer ons een ding bedink oor hoekom dit werkelijk so is, dat iets nie sis of so mag gebeur nie, jy weet, ons Amal glo nie, buiten hevelikse seks is sonde nie, by voorbeeld. Maar, vir kinders om seksueel actief te raak, het geweldige, dit, dit berok in skade. Dit maak dat hulle kans om een graad te kry laar, is wat hulle in een laar socio-economische plek plaas, wat hulle kinders weer onder risiko plaas. En, jy weet, dit het sulke type verreikende gevolge. So, een mens moet seker maak, wat is die rede dat jy by voorbeeld een kind op 16 wil beskerm tegen seksuele activiteit? D- dit gaan oor ons geloof, so vertuiging natuurlijk, maar het gaan ook oor baie meer as dit. En as ouders so eenvoudig wil wees, om net geloofsoortuiging te gebruik as ja nee vir die dinge, en hulle dit wil in teenstand bring dan met die kindse hormone wat wild is en uitstekend werk, dit werk baie goed op die ouderdom, dan maak die kind baie keer nie die rechte besluit nie, want jy het hulle nie toegeris met kennis, en eindelijk dit, dit is nie net kennis nie, jy moet die kind leer as jy sê nou maar nou in een situasie is, om wat jy nou voel, oe, hierdie gaan nou bykie te ver gaan, ek wil nie, ek wil nie dit moet aangaan nie, jy moet die ding bepraat, hoe, hoe gaan jy daar uitkom, jy weet, en is een eenvoudige raad, soos om te sê, ek wil gauw draai gaan loop, mm-hmm. eenvoudig, dit hoef jy nie te laat bloos, om te sê, ek wil gauw draai gaan loop, nie, jy hoef nie eerst die name recht te noem, om dit te sê nie, maar jy moet die kind toeris, met die vermoe, 
om te kan ja of nee sê, of wat ook. Jy weet so, dit is eigenlijk baie eenvoudig aan die een kant, maar aan die ander kant is het nie so eenvoudig soos wat ons het wil maak nie. Dit is beslis nie een vijf minuten gesprek wat nooit weer herhaal word nie. Dit is iets wat oor die kindse leeftijd gebeur. En as die kind veertig is, en jy kan met wijsheid in hulle leven inspreek, nog soveel te beter. So dit is een levenslange proces. Dan nog baie dankie, dit is lekker met jou te sê, as jy, ek moet sê, jy het nog hulle gift om mense op te saak, en jy is vir jou goed, en so bly jy is in hierdie veld, en lever ook een bijdra. Baie dankie. Mag die kaap ook dan sy gave vir julle geer, Iesel. Baie dankie, ek word deur. Dankie vir die saamwees. Groot plezier. Let's read together from 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. From the message, those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex, use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. Since then, you've been cleaned up given a fresh start by Jesus, our Master, our Messiah, and by our God, present in us, the Spirit. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in Scripture, the two became one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the Master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. Is the good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. I'm simply trying to point out that under your new master, you're going to experience a marvelous freedom you would never have dreamt of. So we're busy with the topic of sexuality and best way to start is with the definition of sexuality. Ronald Rollizer says, sexuality is an all-encompassing energy inside of us. In one sense, it is the identifiable with the principle of life itself. It is the drive for love, communion, community, friendship, family, affections, wholeness, consummation, creativity, self-perpetuation, immortality, joy, delight, humor, and self-transcendence. It is not good to be alone. It's well worth thinking about these words. There's a drive, a yearning, a force, a fire. The Greeks called it eros, inside of us, to transcend, to move beyond ourselves, to connect, to have community, to have unity, to create, to be creative, to be joyful, to celebrate. It's all part of this energy inside of us. We're living with pictures, and I want to ask you what your picture is of sexuality. When would sexuality be in full bloom for you? Well, I'll share a a few pictures that I had the past few weeks. The first one was going out of church. I saw a couple, elderly couple, I suspect around about 80, holding hands on the way to the motor vehicle to go home. He stopped. And he wanted to go somewhere, and uh, they kissed each other, and he went. She waited for him, and as he came back, she stretched out her hand to ask for his hand, to take hands again and move on to the car. At the car, he opened up the door, closed the door for her, made sure the... A safety belt is properly in its place, and I left. And I was touched by it, and I couldn't help but think, isn't this a wonderful picture of a sexuality in full bloom? 
saw a mother breastfeeding. And she was totally lost in the act. She was singing a lullaby to her baby, totally self-unconscious. And the baby was enjoying it. You could see it by its feet moving. It was like a little cat purring. And I thought, what a wonderful picture of a sexuality in full bloom. I visited a friend. She's nearly 70 now, retired, never got married, don't have any children. And as we spoke, I asked her, didn't you, don't you feel a miss in your life? Didn't you feel that you've missed out on life? She looked at me and she said, no. I knew when I made some decisions that I wouldn't have everything in life. And I think in this life, you can't have anything, everything in depth. And I'm okay with it. I'm not focusing on what I couldn't have or didn't have or achieve in life. I'm satisfied and I'm so deeply grateful and thankful for my life. And as I listened to her, saw her joy, her engagement with life, the community she lives in, the love that she has for people and sharing her life, I couldn't help but feel a sexuality in full bloom. So if you picture perhaps was something that you got from a screen and that has more to do with Hollywood and, and perfect naked bodies, it might make sexuality very small. Because sexuality is something much more bigger. Uh, the, the idea that sex is sexuality it's a Mr. Mainer. Sex cannot carry or give you what a sexuality can give you, a healthy, life-giving sexuality. If you think that sex equals sexuality, you'll be deeply disappointed in life. You will never find fulfillment. You will blame the people around you for the lack of of fulfillment and joy that you receive in life. It's much more bigger. So the, here's the first invitation. Not to think of sexuality as sex by itself. And to develop um, an idea, an imagination, and a feeling of the largeness of sexuality. Today, invitation through three words, uh, three ideas, three stories to move towards a more mature, life-giving sexuality and sex life. The first one is good. That's the first word. Paul says, first, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly. And I cannot help but think that he echoes Genesis 1, where God made man and woman, Adam and Eve, looked at them and said, it is good. And then said that they would become one. And it is good. So there's nothing bad about the fact that we are sexual human beings. In fact, so much of our joy, so much of, I mean, most of the ecstasies experienced every day is through a sexual encounter and through the fact that we are sexual beings. But like with every other endowment that we are born with, it's got to be developed. You know, our cognitive ability, our ability to think, knowledge, emotionally to feel, and we can go on every ability that you have, has to be developed. And so it is with sexuality. And perhaps we can explain it very practically, um, just to give you an idea and a feel of, of, of how it develops in life. Let's take a boy, for instance. 
in his adolescent years, he's got dreams. And perhaps he's a bit selfish. But um, there comes a stage with all the hormones and the release of all the hormones in him that his mood changes, that his thinking, he becomes obsessive. It's all that he thinks about so much of the time and he just wants to have sex. Particulars are not important. I want sex. A little bit later in his life, he, feel, he falls in love. Suddenly, he wants something more than sex. He wants intimacy, exclusivity, a commitment. Suddenly, there's a new inner dynamic happening inside of him. And his idea of sex is developing. And he moves into a more mature sexuality. Later in life, he got married. And um, it's good for a while, but then he wants children. And again, something happens to him. He gets a lot of no's. Not now. And he, at, at that stage, I personally think it's, it's, it's the stage in life where mutuality uh, uh, becomes a, a, a very important engraved experience. And the realization that my sex drive is a desire. It is not a need. It is not something like food that I cannot go without. And without resentment, he can put aside his desires and his longings for something bigger. And the process that doesn't stop there. He becomes a gra grandpa father and um, it keeps on developing and growing through life. So that's an invitation to, to, to say yes through the different developmental stages of your sex and your sexuality. The second big word is chaste. Now, um, Paul says it's a good thing to have sexual relations, but only within a certain context. He's referring to chastity there. Although the word is not used. He used it explicitly when he wrote to Titus and said, be chaste. I spoke to a few friends about this word and I didn't get a lot of positive reaction using this word. It's not a word commonly used in our vocabulary today. And most of them made connections with prudeness, with celibacy and made jokes about it. But the word chaste actually means that you are respectful, you have reverence, and you act in patience. Towards an experience involving people, things, places, and time. Um, in, in, in the case of sex, for instance, a time, a maturity, the certain stage in your life, when you, you've developed emotionally, socially, to the extent that you are ready for such an encounter. If you are chaste, the experience will be experienced as integrative. You'll be thankful. There'll be a lot of joy. If you're not chaste, there'll be irreverence, impatience, disintegration, cynicism, and it would be a violation of somebody or something. That's why the philosopher Karma said, Chastity alone is connected to personal progress. A story. I was a student minister and once spoke to a young student, a girl, who was suffering from anxiety attacks and depression and um, inner chaos happening in her life. She was in a relationship with a few men, a few other students. And um, she was sexually involved with them. It became very complicated for her. 
you know, and you, you could see the turmoil. She didn't experience community. She was all by herself. She was bitter, full of cynicism. And in our discussion, I was amazed that she couldn't make a connection with the way that she lived and the inner experience she was sitting with. In fact, um, she felt that her problem was a physical problem and she needed medication, something else to help her with her mood. That would be the solution. Speaking about her way of life, she felt that what she's doing is actually a moral victory, getting rid of chastity. Because that is something that the church and her mother and father sold to her. They indoctrinated her. But they are naive. They don't know what the real life is about. You know, for her, it was a victory. And I wonder about what she said and how she felt about it. And I wonder whether she was a bit naive about the power of sex, the energy that's released through this. Um, she thought, reflecting on it, I would get into paradise by eating of the forbidden fruit. Actually, the old story is that you will lose paradise. Yes, you will gain the knowledge, first-hand knowledge of good, of evil. And now she sits with that experience. But she cannot recognize it, just as Adam and Eve cannot recognize it. And there is no remorse or insight or tears flowing that might purify her heart and the inside. It's a big word, chastity, and it's a challenge for us. The third word is complex. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical act. So these two words, spiritual and physical, it is both. It's not either or. And um, uh, somebody once said that um, the world ended up with passion and the church ended up with chastity, and both of them are losing. You know, we cannot divide spiritual and physical. And we cannot think and say that, for instance, it's just a physical act. It's just a normal urge, need that God has created us with. And it is, um, it's neutral. And it, is, uh, it, 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 it won't bring any harm it's not the truth. Why are there laws about sex? With whom you have sex? Where you have sex? When you have sex? Why? Because it is dangerous. Because it has a tremendous effect on us. It is not neutral. It is spiritual as well. So here's an invitation from Paul is to bring your sexuality and your spirituality together. To... to a heal the split between sex and God and your spirituality. And to do that is not easy. It's a struggle. And some of us has a huge struggle with it. Let me explain it with the story once again. A little baby was born with male and female organs. After tests and deliberation with the parents, they decided that she would become a little daughter, a little girl. She grew up, and later in her teenage years, she visited the doctor, and he did some tests on her. And what he discovered is that she don't have any female inner organs. Um, and he did a test on chromosomes and found out that she had manly chromosomes, XY. 
It turned her whole life upside down. She was a follower of Christ and her first cry was, why did you do this to me, God? Why should I live with this burden? It was um, because of the fact that she couldn't really understand now, what am I? Am I male? Am I female? Of course, that was one of the first things that boggled me when I realized her story is that there, there aren't just two sexes, male and female. She was born both male and female. But now she couldn't decide upon her gender. She was uncertain. The gender is how you feel about your um, sexual state. And then her orientation. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm used to date boys. What, what's going to happen to me now? And well, what am I going to do now? One of the doctors suggested a very simple solution. Let's do the operation and make you a man. She was totally upset by it. She was also upset by the church that told her, you're not allowed to do anything here and, and what you should do. People had simple answers for her and it hurt her. It is complicated. Luckily, she met and became part of a community that said, come on a journey. Let's pray about it. Get in contact with the deepest desires in your heart. Listen to that still, small voice. Look at what's happening in your relationships. Let's do some studies. Let's talk about it. Let's discern with Christ where you should go with your life and what's the next step in your sexuality and the path that you should take. Friends, and that's our invitation to become humble and perhaps to be like Jesus, not perhaps really, to be like him and to be open to the stranger and to the strange things that we're getting to do with. To accept, to listen, to be compassionate and to be in that space where something creative and new can happen and where God can lead and heal like Jesus did with all the people that he met. I want to ask you where you are at this moment in your life and perhaps what's your invitation this morning. Well, first of all, I suppose it's to talk. We don't talk about this stuff. Paul talks about it. The Bible talks about it. There's a whole book about it. We've got to talk about it. Since early age, we've got to start talking about it. And then we've got to share our pain, our struggles. We've got to be very courageous to live the life that we are called to live and to develop a life-giving sexuality. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the way that you've made us. Help us to accept and more than accept, to celebrate. Help us to grow, to develop and heal us. For some of us are in the bonds of addiction, confusion, guide us. Let your will be done in our lives. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.